spate of stories when it comes to the race hustle. Uh, some pretty encouraging, actually. Uh, two teens kicked out of uh, St. Francis High School in Mountain View, California, were awarded a million dollars by a jury uh, because they were improperly kicked out. The school saying that they took a picture when they were 14 years old uh, of um, of themselves in blackface when, in point of fact, it was just a green acne face mask oh. that they were wearing. Yeah, we've used those at home. Uh-huh. They took a photo of themselves at the sleepover, 14-year-old boys during a sleepover in 2017, and seven years later... They get a little bit of justice, million dollars. Catholic school, elite Catholic school. Right. Good. I'm glad the Catholic school there is going to take it in the pants. Yep, me too. These elite schools, not much different than the government schools, as we've well documented. Just, uh, you know, go up the road to Wilmette and take a perusal of what's happening at Loyola Academy. Um, uh, then there's this, like we have in Evanston, seeing more and more of this. Uh, Vermont's housing program, $25,000 for forgivable loans for home buyers who are black, indigenous, or people of color. Mm -hmm. yeah, Harvard, Business, <laughs> Harvard Business Review, U.S. firefighters are overwhelmingly white and male. Here's why that needs to change. Hmm. Oh, the Firefighters Union, which uh, mainly serves as an appendage of the Democrat Party. Certainly that's the case in Chicago and Illinois. Heads up, gentlemen. Careful who you're in bed with. Don't might, come crying. Might come back to bite you. And, of course, college campuses. Uh, SIU had five separate segregated graduation ceremonies. Black, what? Hispanic, Asian, LGBTQ, and non-traditional. Yeah, segregation is the resegregation. It's the new fad, as we've, again, been documenting for years now. And uh, it just keeps going. It just keeps going. This is an announcement by uh, a flack for Governor Hochul of New York about this um, uh, renovation of JFK that they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, big public works project. $2.3 billion in state funds to renovate J JFK Airport. But, you know, it's uh, not for the honkies. What we didn't want to happen is to go back to the community, and Jim, you know this, and people look at us and say, well, what did you do? No one on that project looks like us. No one in that project represents us. We did not want to have those conversations, and that's why those tireless meetings that took place on Zoom, it was, micro, what was it, Microsoft, <laughs> WebEx, or whatever it was, and it wasn't working, and your bandwidth, and you had to turn off the camera or turn off the mic. Uh, as, as, as annoying as it was, we knew it was for us, for us, by us, to make sure that this community that we represent looks like us. So I just want to say. So it's, I mean, it's like the, uh, the, the foundational document of the Brandon Johnson administration in Chicago. First, you get the money. And again, um, as I'm always quick to say, uh, the Irish did it. Italians did it in big cities. And so now, as uh, more minority groups are ascendant and minority politicians are, black politicians are doing it, Latino politicians are doing it, Asian politicians are doing it, Michelle Wu in uh, Boston. Boston yeah. mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not uh, race-based. It's, uh, it's between-your-ears-based identitarianism. And uh, that eats more of your brain than that worm that was roaming around in RFK Jr.'s head. For uh, more on all of this, we're pleased to be joined by our friend Bob Woodson. Of course, he is the president, founder of the Woodson Center, and um, also 1776 Unites. And uh, he is uh, also the um, author of the bestseller, Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers. Red, White, and Black. Bob Woodson, thanks so much for joining us. As always, appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Dan and Amy. So um, help us take stock, um, because you've, you're in this fight every day, and you have been for 60 years. 
So help us take stock of where we're at. We've seen some clawing back of DEI bureaucracies, but at this and 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 some court cases that uh, enforce uh, anti discrimination laws in every which direction, which are somewhat encouraging. But um, but you know, but then you you have uh, still a lot of money sloshing around in the direction of uh, of identity based politics. Yeah, I think I have to give credit to my young uh, colleague, Delano Squires, and I just keep quoting him because he framed it beautifully. He said, really, this is this is a struggle among elites. This is guilty whites who are seeking absolutions from crimes they never committed and guilty uh, entitled blacks who are seeking absolutions from injustice they never suffered. Right, right. It really is a battle of elites. Um, and this is where you get into identity politics, and one is just one iteration of that. DEI is another iteration of it. Um, but the reality is um, the people who are suffering as a consequence of this are not the ones that have a voice in framing these issues. Um, this DEI and others has produced, as a friend said, a deliberate inversion of moral values, a degradation of competence, and an implosion of social trust. And this takes expression in high crime in these areas as, as the police and lawful authority is, de- uh, is, is diminished and, 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 and degraded. But the re- people who are suffering the consequences of these battles they lead are the people who are most vulnerable in these communities. And that's why it is important to go directly into these communities and listen to what these voices are saying. The Woodson Center is in about 39 uh, communities representing about 3,000 low-income grassroots leaders of all racial groups. And and I spent a lot of time in these communities. And if you look at survey data, 80% of blacks do not support defund the police. They don't support these race grievance uh, issues. They are uh, unalterably opposed to it. Uh, but the, the, the qualities that make them effective make them invisible. And that's why it's important for, for us to, in terms of pushing back against it, to go to the people in the community in whose name the left say they, they are representing them and give them a, a voice in speaking out against these. And, uh, and that undermines the moral authority of the left. We did this in Utah. I, I met with the governor. I met with the, the leader of the House, the Senate, also 35 grassroots leaders uh, in, in, in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. And we had public forums and discussed this. And so when the legislature offered this uh, legislation to um, to 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 take uh, down and and remove DEI, it was supported by people in the community, low income, black, brown, and white groups, and 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 as a consequence, it was b- dismantled, and that's the and that's where we've got to fight this. It cannot just be conservatives whining about what the left does on television and writing white papers about it. Mm-hmm. We must pay. We must invest in those groups in these communities who understand that the continued erosion of moral values, attacks on the fundamental values of this nation, have a consequence of degrading the quality of their life. This isn't some intellectual exercise where people's feelings are hurt. Well, did they, they ever understand ask? that their children are being lost? And so, it is important for us to step join in partnership with these and and invest in these grassroots leaders. And that's how we can push back against DEI, where we did it in Utah. So that's why hundreds of DEI programs are now failing, you know, or sorry, falling out of favor across America? Absolutely. We, uh, corporations are spending $4.8 billion on DEI programs, um, where law firms have to meet DEI requirements. It's almost like a communist checklist. Uh, uh, and, but it's falling out of favor, and that's why it's being dismantled. In Virginia, University of Virginia spent uh, $20 billion on DEI program. One black staffer makes a, a half million dollar salary work training white people to be less racist. Making white people less racist doesn't make black people safer. 
and low-income people understand that that's a waste of resources that should have been spent um, on on helping to heal those communities from within. And so you're seeing what they're doing in Utah is shifting it away from race-based needs to students who are struggling uh, more of a class-based emphasis, and that's where we ought to be placing it. I, I mentioned this the other day. I want to get your take. It seems to me there's a moment coming, and and I don't know exactly when and exactly where, but the situation with uh, Eric Adams and Brandon Johnson and Karen Bass and that uh, Bill Johnston, the mayor of Denver, and and Brandon Scott in Baltimore. I mean, these are all interchangeable people. Uh, it's different people, different names, and different big cities all doing the same thing. And it's producing the same results, uh, expectedly, which are bad. Uh, and it seems to me there is a vacuum in terms of opposition because these are all one-party cities. But there, there's a moment coming because of the sort of layering of social uh, pathologies and importing them with respect to the lawlessness at the border and how that's manifesting itself in big cities, big, the big blue cities where uh, there's going to be a new cadre of leadership that's incubated in these cities that has a different approach. And, you know, they may not call themselves a Republican, uh, but they're going to be more commonsensical or a solutionist like uh, you, Bob. Uh, Probably it will have to be uh, young and black. It's just the the nature of it. Um, You're younger, you know, um, under 60. Um, but but do you see and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure I can point to an example of somebody that I think is, you know, just off stage and ready to come on stage in one of these places. But uh, you're you're much yeah. more on the ground than I am. And, and I just wonder if you see that moment coming too. Oh, absolutely. I think there's already a rebellion in place. Uh, you see where um, uh, if you look at even television that they can't to the extent you got grassroots people like in Boston, in Ra- Roxbury, for instance, where. The mayor is entertaining some uh, exclusive black uh, legislatures. And then the next week, she uh, goes to a recreation center in the middle of low-income black Roxbury and, and takes a gymnasium that the, the, the community has been trying to get the city to renovate for 10 years. And instead, they have now 120 beds for migrants in there, in that black community. They're not putting migrant centers out where the sons, uh, where the Harvard professors live. It's in the low-income black community. And those, those low-income uh, 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 groups, leadership is in, in outrage. And they're speaking up. The same that is happening in Chicago. Uh, grassroots leaders are saying to, to the mayor, you can't put any more uh, shelters here, or why are you spending the, one, uh, the, the teachers' unions demanding $50 billion and new, when, in fact, the kids are failing in those systems. No, there's, there is a quiet rebellion going on. Leadership is emerging from those communities whose, whose neighborhoods are being overrun. Uh, I really believe that, that, that low-income black people are, are, are black patriots. As I travel around these communities, they are not confused about their pronouns. You don't hear the discussion about pronouns and gender identity in these communities. In fact, you'd be laughed out, out of, uh, out, off the scene if you ever came in with that foolishness. But again, uh, we must do more to shine a light and provide the means for these low-income indigenous leaders to, to rise up. Uh, you see it in Denver, where the, the even the liberal mayors are now saying that homeless people should go to New York and Chicago. Right. And 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 I think that that the, the very stress that is produced uh, and the hypocrisy uh, is evident, is self-evident. Here's Maxine Waters talking about some mythical white waiting in the wings for uh, to invade when in fact her city the campuses are in flames in ucla uh in portland oregon 14 police cars were burned by left-wing radicals but you don't hear anyone on on the on the other side progressive side talk about what we what are we going to do about left-wing violence more people have been arrested 
um, in, on these campuses than were arrested this January 16th, January 6th. Right, but a lot of them aren't being charged. I mean, they're being arrested, but the, they let them go. And what message they, they does that do. send? Right, but the point is, I think the the, the hypocrisy of, of it all is becoming self-evident. And, and that's what's going to compel change in these cities um, when when they have when some of these liberal mayors um, are confronted with the hypocrisy of their of their sanctuary city proclamations. Um, it's when they're confronted with the reality of what that means when people have to take resources that could go to help solve the problems of poverty among the people who have been paying taxes. Uh, it's going to be imploding. That's why we've got we've seen a, an ex, an explosion of interest in our curriculum. For instance, we have 160,000 downloads of our red, white, and black curriculum in all 50 states, um, uh, even states like New Hampshire and and Oregon are are looking at it. So I think there's a quiet rebellion going on. Uh, but we've got to, what we're trying to do at the Woodson Center is to try to get some high net worth individuals to make more deliberate investments in these communities so that these, these um, I think, patriots can, can really stand up and defend this nation, uh, its values, because, again, the people in these communities that are suffering with high crime and, and, and drug addiction, they are the ones who have the greatest stake in supporting the values of this nation, of family, uh, of faith, and country. They are the real patriots that we need to be paying attention to. He is Bob Woodson, the founder and president of the Woodson Center, author of Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers, and also... Um, Volume 2 is out, A Pathway to American Renewal, Red, White, and Black, Volume 2, Pathway to American Renewal. It's a, it's a, available for pre-order on Amazon, so do that. Red, White, and Black, Volumes 1 and Volumes 2. Uh, Woodson Center uh, is uh, the organization to support along with 1776 Unites, but it's all a collective there in furtherance of those principles that Bob laid out. Bob, thanks as always for joining us. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a blessed day. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's what Chicago is talking about. It's Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy on AM 560, The Answer. Oh, you're watching everybody else have fun. Hi, Amy Jacobson here. And this is the worst time of year to be suffering from joint pain. You can't enjoy the outdoors like you used to. And if you're tired of those achy joints, contact my good friends at QC Kinetics before you